Good morning, guys. We're a little bit out of sorts here because the training room was taken, so we yeah. kind of had to like figure it out. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? And then we had yes. yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes. I'm sit, like sitting on a couch awkwardly yes. in a room that I wasn't planning on being in. <laughs> How are you? All right. And the rest of the class is over there. So if you see me looking that way, it's because everybody's kind of in a weird spot because it's set up in this room. So, all right. Well, thanks guys so much for coming. Um, we are going to launch right in because lots of great information to go over. Um, so today we're going to talk about preparing for a listing appointment. I know a ton of you have done listings and a lot of you, this is your first time seeing this. Um, the reason I put this on the calendar today was because I'm getting constant calls from you guys, which is fabulous because you have a listing appointment. And the first thing I'm going to say with a listing appointment is this. It's not quite as easy as preparing. You can sit on the couch, Danny. We're going to just get cozy over here and work with it. Um, is you can just pop up and show a house, right? So when you're working with a buyer, you can just figure out how do I schedule a showing? How do I, you know, go walking through a house and show it? Do I have to be totally prepared? I mean, you should, but you can manage through a buyer appointment, I guess is what I'm saying. With the listing, you cannot. You cannot just manage through and just push through. You have to be prepared. Most times with a buyer, you are, you're, you know, you're just kind of there being the person who opens the door and they choose the house. They don't necessarily choose you. You get to be the lucky one who's there. Or if you've actively been working with that buyer, that's a totally different story. When you have a listing appointment, they're, they're choosing you. They're specifically deciding to work with you and not just like picking a house. So you absolutely have to be 10 times more prepared for a listing appointment than you do a buyer appointment. Um, and you may only have one shot. So if it's not someone that you know kind of thing, um, you know, people come to me and say, well, it's it's my parents. Well, you might get a little bit of a cushion there, but it's a great practice. So go through the whole motion like as if it's a stranger every single time and also act like you know, go through it like you're up against five other agents because that's how you get better at doing it. So um, a couple of things I'll say before I jump into a share screen is this. It's about the upfront preparation, but it's also about giving yourself enough time. If a buyer in this market wants to see a house, they want to see it right now, right now, because it's going to be gone tomorrow. With the listing, the first thing I'm going to say is take a breath and give yourself a minute. You cannot prepare for a listing appointment on a high level in an hour. Or if it's today at 11, can I be at a listing appointment tonight at five? Yes, if I have my crap together and I'm ready to grab and go. Then I only have to do the CMA, but I still have to get some information. So I'm going to dive in first into the Google Drive and show you what's in there for upfront preparation. And then we're going to go on the MLS and then we're going to run through the CMA. Because a lot of the preparation for a listing appointment, of course, is the CMA. But if you don't have the your ducks in a row with the questions that you're asking um, up front, you can't prepare. So let me ask you guys this. For any of you here or on Zoom that have gone on listing appointments, do you typically do a one-step appointment where you go out, you've got your CMA with you, um, and you're ready to list at that point? Or are you doing a two-step listing appointment where you're going out collecting information, and then you go back with your CMA? What's, what's the norm? What do you feel is the norm? 
I usually I usually go with the CMA. Yep. Um, Same. I usually um, make myself kind of aware of what's on the market in that area, just so that I can talk. Yeah. Intelligently about price points. Yes. And yeah. Style and what's what their competition would be to find a potential buyer. Yep. Perfect. Two steps. I feel like like two steps give the opportunity for somebody else to swoop in. It does. And sometimes we're forced to do two steps. Here's a scenario where you're forced to do two steps. Yes, come out, but I'm not going to be ready to list or sign papers when you come. Then we have to go back in the future. That's a forced two step. Um, but don't make your listing presentation automatically a two step. I'll say this. It's a very old fashioned way of doing business. And I mean, from 20 years ago, where people felt like they had to go out, sell their self and then get invited back with the CMA. We are in a fast paced world. I mean, if anyone logs on their computer and it's not going quickly, we're like pounding on it. Right. We want instant the results. And so do your sellers. It doesn't make you look more professional or more prepared because you feel like you had to see the house first before you brought a proper CMA. And that's why people do a two-step. And again, I'm not saying you have to do it this way. I'm just saying be most effective with your time and understand that the client probably wants you coming with a CMA. If you've had, if they've had four other people there, and every single one of them came with a market analysis and you are not, they're going to think you're unprepared. They're not going to think, oh, they're just trying to gather information. They're going to think you didn't come prepared. They want to know the value of their house right then and there. And so we're going to talk about how you can get to that appointment prepared enough. I mean, have I been in a position where I've brought the wrong CMA? Yes. Yes, I have. And by wrong CMA, I mean this, that they, I didn't anticipate the house was as nice as I thought it was going to be based on what they told me. Or I didn't, I wasn't prepared for the disaster that I was walking into. And then I thought the price was too high. And how do we pivot in those situations? So that way the client doesn't know. That takes some skill of learning how to talk to people. Um, better in the situation that the house was less nice than I expected, because then I used the comps to say this, if you want this price, this is how it has to look. When yeah. you, yeah, go ahead. So Something. I would say I would a lot of times I did a two-step because I know already who, most of my listings are referrals. So they're usually giving me a heads up of what the house looks like. So I do go with the CMA. I do go with what different price points are mm -hmm. but to get to the top number usually they have to I don't have usually they sign or sometimes I don't the one I want on Saturday there's no way that could be even listed in a month there so I think it's, sometimes it's forced to two steps because of timing right mm -hmm. we're getting things ready that yeah that's their orders I mean they have so much to clean they have so much to do like they yes. think they listed in two weeks there's no two weeks Yes. In that situation, like I said, there are forced two-step appointments. That would be an instance when it is. But I would say what I mean by a two-step traditionally is this. I'm going out, I'm going to go over my marketing, and then I'm going to take notes. And then I'm coming back tomorrow or the next day to give you the CMA. That's what I'm talking about. That's that's not the same thing. You know what I mean? Like it's don't waste your time in that situation if you can just take care of it. And I'll show you how you can, because in your market analysis, if you've got the right information, like I said, walking into a house that's a disaster, the le at least I could say this, make it look like these pictures. So how do I handle that? If I walk into a house that's hoarders or it's a mess or it smells or you know, you can tell they have animals or whatever it is, what I say to them to be as gentle as possible and not say, oh my gosh, this place is hideous. No one's going to want to buy it, which is what I'm thinking. Um, I say, here, let's look at the comparables that I brought. And I know you said you wanted 159.9 or whatever, but these houses that are 159.9 look like this. Your house needs to look like these pictures if you want that price. So that's my gentle way of saying, clean this place up and make it look like these pictures. And sometimes they're gonna, and sometimes they're not, and that's okay. Now we're 119. 
versus 159 if you can't make it look like this. So so that's how I'm going into that. The problem when you're when I've gone to a house before and it was way nicer than they I thought it was a no offense a Ryan home and I thought it was just typical Ryan home, but actually they built the most expensive Ryan home I've ever seen in my life. So I wasn't anticipating that. And they decked it out like I didn't even know I was in a Ryan home. So I undershot by a hundred thousand dollars. There there's no battling uphill there because I and I just said, Wow, this is so much nicer than I anticipated. And then what I did to pivot was. I forced it to a two-step appointment. Now that I've gathered my information, can I come back tomorrow at five? Because there was no way I was going to show him the the 329 houses that I thought that he should be when he should be 429. So again, that's just an all in preparation that way. And, and again, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong about it. I just think time is money and you don't want to lose the opportunity. If unlike what Sarah said, direct referral that you know is listing with you so you've got time on your side if this is somebody that you know you met at open house or somebody that you got online or some other source of business you might not have time to make it back nothing worse than pulling up into the driveway that an appointment true story hasn't canceled and there's a for sale sign in the yard oh pain pain and those are never the ones that were that are within 10 minutes it's always like the 45 minute drive. Yeah. And then you pull into the driveway of the house that they did not cancel your appointment for your step two. And there's somebody else's for sale sign because they swooped in and got the listing the night before. Um, all right. I did not. But yeah, I know. <laughs> I would say Go ahead. sometimes I pull out bring two separate times too. I have done that too. Yep. Or what I think it's going to be. And then one, like if it's way nicer than it is. Yep. So I'll have two different comps to, and, and the one I'll show him so that I can do. Yes. Time. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to jump into the drive. So there's a whole packet right here in this folder that's seller information. There's other things down in the files as well. But if we just open up the seller information. Some great info in here. Also, there's some stuff in here that you guys should put in your marketing packet as well as in your own folder um, for note taking and stuff like that. But so a couple of things here, get you guys out of the way, that I want to draw your attention to is this form right here. So I do different than today's class that steps in working with the seller so i just want to go over this first page with you all because i'm not going to go through this entire this is a totally different class um so pre-listing phone call so your your listing appointment should be a couple of different steps and the first step is your pre-listing phone call appointment that it, that makes the client feel like They've already had an appointment with you by the time you get there because you're calling it that. So I'm saying, hey, Danny, blah, blah, blah. It was so nice meeting you or talking with you the other day. But you know what? Before I come over, can we schedule a phone meeting so I can get some other information from you to help me prepare for my appointment? that's an appointment you're scheduling it you're having them put it in their calendar you're putting it in your calendar and then you're calling them and then what you're going over hey is um the red sheet so let me take you back to the red sheet here um might be actually in here let's see and it actually used to be a red sheet but it doesn't scan well so now it's not a red sheet um and I got this from JMA. This is what they use. Their ISAs use this form to schedule listing appointments for team members. So you might not have everything on here, but it's a great phone conversation. You do not send this to the client to fill out. Someone's done that. It's meant to be a two-way conversation. And so you're just filling this out and going along the questions. So what I'm trying to establish on this step one with a, with a seller is a couple of things. Tell me all the features that you love about your home. There's a reason that you're saying it that way. 
Because I promise you this, nothing worse than when you get the listing and a seller says, I don't like your remarks. You didn't say anything about the house. That's great. Well, your opinion might be different than my opinion, you know, so that's why I want to put it that way. And I'm taking those notes to make sure that they say there was something they absolutely loved about it that you want to make sure that's important and it's also in the remarks because those remarks are just as much for them as it is for the general public. It's what their agent thinks about the house. And if you don't love it, they may not list with you because they think, well, if you don't like my house, how are you going to sell it? So that's really important. Um, and then also, what do you think, Mr. Seller? What do you think your house is worth? That's a question that we ask them because not because we're going to find the price sorry guys, the coffee is making noise, um, uh, is that I want to know what am I walking into? So I might even do this. So I learned how to ask questions and make comments to clients before they do. If I can take away the question, then they aren't as put their feet in the mud about it. So this is what I mean by that. Sometimes when I say, so Danny, you're in front of me, so you're going to be my victim today. So Danny, tell me, what is it that you think is the value of your home? Sometimes I get this. Well, isn't that why I'm having you come out? Giving me a snarky answer. Um, so what I had, what I've done to take away that as a possibility is this, say it like this. So Danny, I know that you're hiring me to come out to give you the price, but I just want to know, am I bringing good news or bad news? So what do you think the value of your home is? So I've just stolen that snarky comment because now how can they come back with that? It's like saying, I know what you're thinking, but this is why I'm asking it. Um, and then they can start saying things like, well, my neighbor's house, this and the one down the street and the one around the corner and all this stuff. And mine's better than the one across the street because of blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's like the same 25 things that they all say. Um, and it's usually mine's better than the neighbor's because that price was low. Or I love this one. Well, yeah, that, you know, that neighborhood that I'm attached to that really I'm not in they get in the 300s. Um, yeah, but you're a 1977 ranch and they're a brand new neighborhood. So they, they're they in their mind, location, 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 but you don't compare to your neighbor if the house is entirely different. You compare location for comparable properties. Um, so I just want to know what they're thinking. So when I go there, I'm prepared, my mindset's prepared to give bad news or my mindset's prepared to give good news. Or sometimes, um, you know, I think it's worth more than they do. And I'm trying to convince somebody, oh my gosh, let me show you why it's worth so much more than you anticipated. I mean, the last two houses I listed, I actually sold them those houses, like somewhere between seven and 10 years between the two of them ago. They both got over $100,000 more since I sold it to them. And they were so surprised and so happy. They had no idea. Um, so that's why we want to have those conversations. And then all this basic stuff. What do I need to know about your house so that I can come with the market analysis? And then we can kind of go over all the information once I'm there. So that is your step one in regards to uh, that phone meeting. Uh, let me go back here. Then... So that's the red sheet here. Then the next thing that I do is email them the marketing packet. So I'm not going to turn this into a making marketing packet class because we do do that a couple times a year, actually about four times a year. So if you don't have a marketing, let's first show a hand. Who has a marketing packet? Almost everybody in the room here. How about you guys on Zoom? Yes. I do. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Um, I guess I don't. Okay. I do okay. Not. So, so then we then need we to get the workshop, workshop on the on calendar, calendar soon. soon. Oops. 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 I'm echoing I'm now. Echoing now. It's, it's, right. Um, so I think I might have put one on for next month. I'm not sure. But here's what you can do meanwhile. It is so important, especially to have a listing marketing packet. Can I get through a buyer appointment without one? Yes. 
Do I, do I advise it? No. Do you want to stand out from the other agents they may have talked to? Then you need a marketing package. I would say this. I, at any given moment, I have five buyer packets and five marketing packets and really five closing packets ready to grab and go at any given moment. Um, and I also have recruiting packets. So I've got packets up the wazoo. Um, and you can do red folders for listings and black folders for buyers to make it easy so you don't grab nothing worse than grabbing the wrong one. But if I show up to a buyer appointment and I just have the MLS sheet, it's like you're empty handed. If this is the first time I'm meeting a buyer, what are the chances I'm gonna get a consumer guide signed if I've given them nothing? in return. It's very easy to get your consumer guide signed because it's stuffed into your marketing packet. And then you can also pull out the exclusive buyer's agency agreement and explain that at some point you guys are going to make an agreement to work together. But that comes across so much better if you're giving them a folder of information. Um, however, you can, you can skate through with the buyer. Do not go on a list. I would tell you this, don't go on a listing appointment if you don't have your marketing materials together. Don't go on it. Do not go until you have it. You are a professional. If I walk into a nice restaurant and they don't have a menu, but they have a QR code on the wall, not at my table, up on the wall, and I got to walk to the front like it's McDonald's, I'm not happy about that. I, I want... That I want the experience that you're going to present yourself way worse. I'd assume that you tell them you can't come till next week so that you can get your crap together and make sure you go prepared. You only have one chance to make a first impression. You will not look professional if you don't have materials to bring. Um, so keep that in mind. And where do you make them from? Well, in command, in designs, there are five templates for buyers and five templates for sellers, and they're all customizable. So I would say you don't need all 32 pages of each one or whatever it is, but you can pick the five to eight pages you like and then put your photo on it, put your information on it. I mean, if you don't have time to do that, at least just clean it up a little bit and print what's there. You can, through command designs, customize every appointment with the house photo, that's going to take a lot more work. I I personally like the grab and go. And if it's something special, I might personalize it, but have yourself five to eight pages of stuff that you're going to provide. Read through it. If you're going to use designs and command and you don't remember this, Keller Williams is national, actually international. So those documents, those forms are general. There are things they do in other states that we don't do in Ohio, such as have attorney read documents. We don't need to do that here. You don't want your paperwork you're passing out to your seller to say that when we don't do that here. Also this, nothing like leaving on a page that you're going to pay for professional staging. If you put, if you hand that to somebody in a packet, guess who's paying for professional staging? You are. So you have to go through and look through it and the, everything is clickable and you can customize it or delete it. So you, you should have some kind of a packet and decide what pages go in it. We have examples here in the drive as well of a packet. Um, the title companies provide a system called Breakthrough Broker, some of them, which has flyers you can create. Um, I know a couple of the lenders also provide, Cross Country provides Total Expert, which you can make flyers or you can go on Canva and just get creative using some type of a template. But what those papers are saying that you're leaving with them in that packet is what am I going to do to help you? You don't need to feel like this. Oh my gosh, I've only been in the business for a little bit and I don't have a bragging page. Hey, guess what? They don't care about all that you've done. They want to know what are you going to do for me? So it doesn't have to say 25 years of experience. They're just looking at what are you going to do for me? Um, so that's what's important, you know, with that. Anyway, so I then email that to them. So we've done our phone conversation. Next step is email your marketing packet ahead of time. I also include in that email a property disclosure and if necessary, a lead-based paint. Because I want to get that step out of the way if we possibly can. So. I can also determine um, if somebody is a high C personality, 
the second that I walk into the house because they have printed the packet and it's sitting right there on the table. And they've already filled out the RPD, which means, oh my gosh, they're probably going to list with me, right? Um, a D personality might not even know that you sent it necessarily. They didn't have time to look at their email unless you told them. So if you told a high D personality that you're going to send it to them, they probably read it over quickly, but they didn't print it. A high I, they don't even remember that you were sending them an email, even though you told them five minutes ago, right? So that helps you kind of determine personality as well. Um, even though I'm going to bring the packet, it's still a nice thing to send ahead of time to give them some time to think about things and questions. All right, before I move on to the four phases of a listing appointment, and then we're going to dive into the CMA, what questions do you have about marketing materials? Oh, why are you bringing it to the appointment and not sending it to them like beforehand? I am emailing to them as well. Oh. And I'm bringing a hard copy too. Right. So one, some people may not print it at ever, and they may not have looked at it. So I need to go prepared. So I'm doing both. I'm emailing it and I'm bringing a hard copy. And it's in some kind of a folder. We don't have to buy expensive folders. You can go to Office Max and buy glossy red or glossy white or black photos or whatever. Um, you have a place to put your business card, that kind of thing. The office here has like bulk. Yep, buy you can. Yep, I I use those, but not everybody, you know, feels like they, they want 10 cent folders. And that's fine too. Just has to be something. I wouldn't staple the packet together and hand somebody like that but some kind of a folder. If you can't pay for branded folders, which is fine, then go to Office Max and get some nice folders is fine as well, or even Walmart for that matter. Yep. All right, so the four phases of a listing appointment. So I break it down like this because in my mind, I'm a checklist person and I wanna get through this phase and then on to the next phase. So I divide up actually in the appointment and in my mind, the listing appointment in four phases. So now I've already, I've, I've got my packet, I've emailed it to them. I've got all the information. So I have my CMA with me. In addition to the folder, what else am I bringing to the listing appointment? A couple of things. I have my own folder that the, the marketing packet is sitting inside. And then what I am bringing is something to take notes on, which we have a form in here that I'll show you that's an easy guide to follow through taking notes about the stuff about the house. And I'm bringing the tax and legal. So I have actual information and you'll want that for two reasons. It actually gives you the correct square footage unless they've added an addition or something like that. And it's gonna give you correct information in regards to who's on title. And a couple things about that that I caution you at. They may not remember when they bought the house 25 years ago that they put it in a trust. They know, but they don't think about saying that. Nothing worse than doing all the listing paperwork in somebody's name to just find out that they should have signed as a trustee or some other kind of ownership. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, the four phases. The first phase is sit down, get to know you, chat, and go over the marketing packet and combined. Even, even though I might know you, or even though we had some nice conversations over the phone, you probably haven't talked to both people. In most cases, there's two people you're going to be selling with. And I want to get to know the other person. And you better make sure the decision maker is at this appointment. Don't just have someone say, oh, you know, my spouse doesn't work, but come at two in the afternoon. No, no, no. I need both, to, both people to be there who can sign, and I definitely need the decision maker there. Nothing worse than going through the appointment with the wrong spouse. Um, there's information gatherers, and then there's decision makers. It's not always the same person. Um, in any case, so we're going to sit down, preferably at a table preferably at a kitchen table. If they don't have a kitchen table accessible, then it's going to be the kitchen counter. I don't prefer, like I am today, sitting on a couch. Something about getting cozy on the couch just doesn't quite feel as professional. Also, they're sitting across from you. So imagine that Danny and I are in a listing appointment and he's way over there. How am I supposed to be showing him stuff in a comfortable way from across the room? And I just don't really want to sell on people's furniture, honestly, because you never know where you're going to be. Um, and so uh, it just doesn't feel, it feels too at home 
you want to take the home out of it and make it more like a professional business exchange that way. With a buyer, we want it to feel like home. With a seller, it's a business transaction. We want to slightly start to disconnect them from the that hold they have on the home because then there's emotions involved then. We want to disconnect that slightly to make it more like a business transaction. So we're going to get to know each other. And one of the things we're talking about is tell me what you're goal is for today's appointment. I always ask that. What is your goal for today's appointment? They usually look at me and like, I, I don't know what you mean. Well, let me ask you this. If you like everything and we come to terms, are you prepared to list the house today? They might say yes. They might say, I don't know. We'll see where we're at. Also, as we're walking through the house, are there things that you have questions about that might need to be done? Nothing worse than shooting out things that they could fix if they didn't give you their permission to do that. Now they start to get offended. You could say the same exact thing as you would have said without the permission, but when they've given you permission to basically be critical of some things that they can do, then they're okay with it because they gave you permission. So as we're walking through, are there things that need to be done to the house that you would like suggestions on? Yes, no, maybe, don't know. And it really is presented as a question. Were you going to sell the house with the rusty hot water heater that's leaking or were you planning on replacing that? It's a question. Um, it may still sound like a jab, but it is what it is that's going to hurt the, the listing, of course. Um, and then I'm going over the marketing packet because I want this time to sit down here to talk to be somewhat short, 10, 15 minutes. I can go over the marketing packet in like 10 minutes. Also read their body language. If they're backing away, they're sick of hearing you speak. They want to stop talking. And then we can kind of finish talking about things as we're walking through the house. So then phase two is now let's get up and tour the home. So hopefully this is under a half hour so far. I really try to keep a listing appointment to an hour and a half, and that's with signed docs. It doesn't mean that you have a better chance of getting a listing because you've been there for three hours. That's just wasted chit chat. That doesn't mean they're giving you the listing. Um, even if they feed you, <laughs> it doesn't mean they're giving you a listing. That's guilt. Every time someone's trying to give me cookies and tea, I'm like, oh boy. This isn't because they love me. It's because they feel like they have to feed their guests. Um, and I'm not really a guest. I'm here trying to get a listing. Um, phase two, I'm taking a tour of the home. You want something to take notes on. You want to know the questions that you need to ask. I'll, I'll go to the form here in a minute. But the best form really to get really acquainted with is the residential input sheet. It is in everybody's dot loop. You should learn it. You should know it because that is going to have all the red fields that are going to be required that when you enter that listing on the MLS and it follows that path. So as you're going through the pages on the MLS, it's going to follow that form. Um, it's not user friendly enough to try to zigzag around the house. So knowing what you need to ask, but not necessarily following, because the path to me is this. We're probably here in the kitchen. Let's walk out front. And then I'm taking notes on what I'm observing. Brick ranch home, two car attached garage. Can you tell me the age of the roof? Can you tell me the age of the windows? Ask questions about the things that you're seeing. Um, you know, it looks like these concrete steps are crumbling a little bit. Any way we're thinking about repairing that? or not, whatever. Is that basketball hoop staying? Because that's an attached in the ground, bolted in basketball hoop. But of course it's just bolted in. That means that the posts can actually come out. Is that staying? Is that going? Those basketball hoops are expensive. People, they want to take them with them. Flag, flag poles, same thing. I've had so many arguments with sellers about take the flag pole back um, because they didn't exclude it and it was considered an attachment. So asking those questions, backyard, fenced in yard, not fenced in yard. Tell me a little bit about, you know, this and that professionally landscape, deck, patio, whatever I'm seeing. Then back in the house and I'm taking notes based on the tour. And I'm imagining four year, two story, wood flooring, gas fireplace in a two story, great room, four bedrooms, all have ceiling fans and lights in the closets, blah, blah, blah. Bathroom in here, bathroom in there, lots of closet space, storage space, you know, whatever, anything I'm seeing. And then when you get to the basement, then I need ages of things again, age of the furnace, age of the AC, age of the hot water heater. Is the electrical and plumbing updated? Is it not? 
I see a radon mitigation system in the corner there. When was that installed? Um, all those things. Sump pump, is the sump pump working? Is there anything that you need to tell me down here that, that I should know? Um, those kinds of things. You're also going to get accustomed to what to look for in a house if you start going to home inspections. Um, I know what I'm going to see that's going to cause a VA or FHA problem. So the floor was painted and it's peeling. That's going to be a VA FHA problem. The seller is going to have to fix those things per the, the financing. Or the duct work is wrapped in asbestos. That's that that's that fabric-y looking white stuff that sometimes you'll see around a furnace. That's going to be a problem in most cases for, for FHA and VA. So you need to know these things. Are you, Mr. Seller, prepared to make these fi this fixes if uh, we get a buyer that's going VA, let's say? Yes or no? If so, I need to know when I put this listing in the MLS because it's going to say mortgage on the MLS and you need to say cash conventional FHA VA. If it's not because the seller is not going to do the stuff, then it's not. So you'll start to learn things like that. So the tour shouldn't take any more than about 30, 40 minutes, depending on the size of the house. So that's ending phase two. As I'm walking through, I'm also asking questions about different things I want to learn about the seller. And I'm also giving them opportunities to talk to me as we're walking through. We're having a conversation, too. Gina, do you yeah. ask if you could take pictures? I don't personal take personal reference. No. no. Nope. I'm not going to probably waste my time to do that. I, I can remember. I'm going to go home. If I am doing a two-step, I'm going to go home and do the CMA then. What would I need to reference back? I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not on so many listing appointments that I can't remember what their house looked like probably. So I don't, but there could be a reason to do so, but you would need permission for sure. Anytime you photograph anybody's house, you have to have permission for that. Um, so then phase three is now we're going to sit back down because now I've seen the house and now I've seen the condition. I've not just seen the front door to the kitchen. I've seen the rest of the house and maybe it looks different than the part of the house I've seen. So now I can, like Janice said, pull out the pages of my CMA that I'm going to use. So sometimes I'm like, I've got my stack and, oh yeah, no, this one's much too nice. I'm putting it to the side. Okay, here's here's comp one. And then so on that way. And I'm not necessarily showing them all of them. I'm probably not ever really showing them all of them because there's always going to be a range based on the comparables. If it's this condition, it's this. And if it's this condition, it's that. Um, right now, we're obviously, we've been in a shortage of listings over the past three years. So there's fewer comps. So you kind of have to dig in a little bit deeper. If the house doesn't look like those, then you have to try to elaborate on if we want this price, it has to look like this. Another thing I do with comps is this. So Danny told me that he wanted $399 for his house. But but for me, I'm thinking it's $350 from just having had the phone conversation and went on the MLS and did a CMA. So now that I've been here, I can see why he's thinking $399. But we're not quite there yet. What I'm going to do, though, is because he told me $399, i am bringing my comps, and I'm also bringing houses that are $399. I want to show him why he's not $399. So some people would think, isn't that counterproductive? You're bringing comps that are priced that he said if you don't think it's it's an eye-opener. When you can, if you just show them comparables, the price that you think they should list at, and they think their house is better than that, they're going to still think it should be $399. But when I show them the $399 and they're like, uh, now I see why we're not, we're 50,000 apart here, which could be this. You have a three bedroom. This is a, These are four and five bedrooms. You have a two car garage. These are all three car garages. This is the location of your house. This is the location of those houses blah, 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 upgrades, you know, all those things. And then they can really realize why they're not up there with the 399s. So showing them the price range that they think the house should be at is really going to help you get the right price. It's probably not going to make them say, see, my house is just like this. 
Um, so that's, is that a second day appointment? Mm -hmm. Is that like the first day that you would bring that? I'm bringing all of it Okay. the first time, because if we're going to have an argument or discussion by argument, I don't mean fight. I yeah. mean, a discussion or debate about the price. I want to have my evidence right there. So I'm going to immediately show you why you're not the price you thought you should be. Gotcha. Are but you going lower to just like, say, this is why we're not going in. I'm going to pull the comps just doing high in what it should be. So this I'm bringing the comps. But if I know the seller is overshooting, I'm going to show them the price range they were overshooting to. Sometimes they're right on the mark. Maybe you said $399 and it is $399. So there's no reason for me to show you $450 if you didn't bring up $450. Does that make sense? That's only in the case that I know you're going to disagree with me about my $350 price. So I'm now bringing the $399 to show you why we're not. And those are already in my my folder. And and sometimes I don't pull everything out. Sometimes I do. Um, just depends on how the conversation is going. So review the and decide on the price. At this point, we're determining how do we feel about the price? What do we think about the things that need to be done to get this price? Those kinds of things. And then phase four is simply let's do the ducks. So here's how I handle the situation of what I've got a million things to do before we can list because the house needs painted or it needs cleaned out or any of the number of reasons why someone might not be ready right now, I'm still doing the paperwork. Let's still sign everything and leave the dates off the contract. Either we can pick a date in the future. So I could say, you know what, do you think you'll be ready by October 1st? Yes. Great. Let's sign everything October 1st. Can we legally do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because your listing agreement says, I am hiring you as of October 1st to market and list my house. It doesn't matter that it's the end of August. We can we can agree to that. Um, the other thing that we can do is this. Can I sign documents and leave the date for the listing off? Because maybe they say, whereas I would love to be ready by October 1st, I'm also waiting on contractors to get back to me and I'm not really 100%. Um, that's fine. If you have agreed that we agree on price, you like everything I have to say and you're ready to choose me, let's go ahead since we're here and, and sign all the paperwork. We're gonna leave the date off of the exclusive right to sell. We're gonna leave the time frame off. And then when you're ready to list, then I'm going to come back anyway, because I've got to at that point measure rooms and take photos. And then I'm gonna have you put the date and then we're gonna initial where we added the date to the already signed contract because we have to initial that that's considered a change to the document. Does that make sense? Good. Could they still, if you don't have a date on it, could they back out? They absolutely could. So thank you for bringing that up. So I have files in my drawer of, of contracts that were signed that never came to be a listing. They absolutely can because that is not a fully signed contract. However, the seller gets an extra level of commitment with you because they know they've signed documents. They don't necessarily realize that it's not something that we can enforce on them because there was no date. Can they go list with somebody else? They absolutely can because it's not been dated. So stay in touch, that's not a sure thing. Um, but but it just gets the paperwork out of the way and it also just gives them another level of commitment to you, for sure. The, the amount of times that I lost a listing that way are so few compared to the numbers of ones that eventually were ready to list and we we pulled the trigger. All right. I immediately sent a thank you card and I'm so looking forward to working with you, whether or not we listed, we didn't list or whatever the situation. Next step is to make an appointment to take pictures and put up the for sale sign and lockbox, listing the home on the MLS, marketing, scheduling open house. I do a feedback Monday. That was during a time when houses didn't sell in three days. Every Monday was feedback. So we had a conversation about the feedback, even though through the showings they're getting the feedback. I'm not interested in getting into a long conversation every time someone does feedback. So I set them up to know. So Danny, every Monday, we're going to have a conversation at this time to discuss the week's worth of feedback to see if we need to make any adjustments. So feedback Mondays and price production Friday. So if we haven't sold every Friday, we're gonna talk about the feedback and we're gonna talk about reducing the price potentially. Um, and then sending out postcards to the neighbors or whatever you might be putting in place for marketing that way. Questions on that? 
do you talk price reduction strategy with in your initial meeting? Only if we're going to overprice it. So if I know that they're disagreeing with me on the price, but I'm still taking the listing, then I'm going to say something like this. By the way, in your, so you're going to bring all the documents with you. Unlike with buyers, I'm have doing everything on dot loop. With sellers, I'm bringing the hard copies with me. Um, it's weird to say, and now I'll send you the documents in dot loop when I go home. They may have changed their mind by that. So I bring those documents with me. And included in there, I also bring a price reduction form, which is your status change form. Because if we're about to overprice it, then I'm going to say, well, we're going to do it your way for this amount of time, whatever we agree on, depends on the market. And then after that, we're going to do it my way. So here's the, what do we agree is the first price reduction or the only price reduction? Um, and then I'm going to have you sign that now too. So great way to get that out of the way if you can. Sometimes they have to feel the pain of the market first before they will do that. But that's okay. It's good to arm yourself with that information. So I want to have time to jump on the MLS and have questions, but this is the form here that I was talking about that's listing information that goes through rooms and room sizes and notes that's in here. Um, a seller's net sheet is extremely important, so I'm going to pull that up. You should all for sure have a seller's net sheet in your packet because you need to let them know our list price is this. And then here's what you're going to net based on what your payoff is. You you should have this every dot loop. Every loop for a seller, you should absolutely have this. And then you see there's a second column. So I do a net sheet based on the list price. And then I revise it based on the offer we got in actual numbers. If it's multiple offers, then I'm doing multiples of these. Um, also in this file folder here, get back to it, is um, information on utilities, which is just an idea to create a form for your packet that you can send to them upon closing. Where's that at? Right here, utility information. Um, just about the seller, um, Mitch. Uh-huh. Um, those numbers that's pre-filled in, is that like estimate? So, so there's certain things each county has. So like you will have to find out your county. So Stark Summit County is a is a four percent tax transfer. And then there's this. Uh, let me pull it back up. Some of the things are so like this here. That that's a standard. I'm sorry. This first one. Your owner's policy two point eight seven five per thousand. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I would just say that. Title has one. Yep. That you can just plug in numbers and it calculates it all. Yeah. Most of the title companies have an app that you can also use. So absolutely use that as well. Well, this is the sheet. This is just change in the numbers based on like what title company. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I want to also show you this before I jump onto the MLS. This is an offer summary sheet. So you've got your listing and now you start receiving offers. This is just a guide. You can certainly use this as well, but I just wanted to make you aware. Um, what I do every time I get an offer is I send an email summary to my seller summarizing the offer, including the actual offer itself. I want them to know the offer price is this, the earnest money is this, this is how much they're putting down. They are pre-approved with this lender and um, they're pre-approved for a conventional loan. They're asking for this amount in closing costs. Here's the inspections they're doing. Here's the um, appliances and things that they're asking for. Here's one I will caution you keeps coming up. I just got an um, email yesterday from an agent who graduated coaching a while ago and said, hey, I have a seller who when they moved out of the house, they took their nest with them. Even though the purchase agreement, the buyer's agent did check all electronic doorbells and thermostats stay, my seller replaced it with a old-fashioned, just regular thermostat. Do they need to bring the nest back? Yes, it said so in the purchase agreement. Um, so be very well aware. TV brackets, the mounts become an issue. The TVs are not considered something to stay but the mounts are bolted to the wall. So those are, but it's negotiable. There's no have to. 
Um, people shouldn't be taking their water softeners. That's craziness, the stuff that people will take. Um, be very clear on what appliances are staying, what appliances are going. So you're going to spell that out. I've had a situation where my summary saved me with my seller, even though the purchase agreement said that the built-in fire pit, which was built-in in the sense that they had a a natural gas line to it, but it wasn't like in the ground, um, was staying. Even though my buyer or my seller initialed the page that said it was staying, he took it. And let me tell you why he took it. He took it because when he got divorced, his wife wanted one. So he had to give her the one from the house and he had to buy a new one. And now he didn't want to leave one with the new buyer because he already had to replace one from the ex-wife. And so I had to say to him, Mike Lowry was his name. I'll never forget because it makes me think of Will Smith. So Mike Lowry, um, I had to say, listen here, Mike Lowry, take that fire pit right back. The contract says it was staying. And he argued with me and said, um, well, you didn't point it out. I said, well, let me bring your attention back to the email I sent you with a summary. I went back and I resent him the summary, which, by the way, said fire pit stays. So they won't care that they signed that part of the contract. They'll say you didn't explain it. That's why I always do the summary. There's no questions. Mike Lowry had to buy a new fire pit. So um, be, be careful of those kind of things. All right, questions. And I'm going to jump into the MLS here. Okay, uh, summary sheet. Where is that at? That's Seller information. Any of them reader writer? Hmm? Are they just flat sheets or are they formatted where like you can everything's a PDF in there? Sure. So there's nothing that's editable. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. You then if, then if you edit it in there, everybody would see the edits. So you can download it and then do yeah. Yeah. Honestly. The other thing I do sometimes is I put those documents into dot loop and make it a dot loop document by adding the fields to it. And then you can save it in a holder there. All right, so let's jump in and do a CMA. I'm just gonna kind of make it up as I go. Anybody on Zoom with any questions before we proceed? Well, I get, that was a mouthful and a ton of information there, so I know you probably all have some thoughts and questions. All right, to me, this is the easy part. So getting yourself familiar with the MLS is so, Hey guys, I know I see 10 messages in the chat. It's too hard for me to monitor what I'm doing and read your chat. Unmute yourself and ask your questions, um, even as I'm talking, because I'm not going to be able to go through those questions in the chat. You should be practicing how to use the MLS and practicing how to do a CMA and practicing how to set up searches and all those things. Do not wait until you have a listing appointment. And again, this is why I did this class. I don't know how many of you are offenders, but I know it's a lot. But you wait until you have a buyer before you ask questions. And, and then you have one, and then it's a panic, and you can't get a hold of anybody, and everybody's freaking out because you have a buyer appointment, and you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to write an offer or don't have to do any of those things. Same with listings. Nobody's doing anything and practicing and making time to do this stuff to learn the systems until, oh my gosh, somebody wants me to come over in two hours and I need someone to help me. That's why we do these classes. It's also recorded so that you can go back and reference it. We're here to help you, but we can't be available on the spot. We also sell houses and there's also a hundred of you. So we can help you as much as possible, but being prepared ahead of time is going to save you from the headache and stress of being ready for a listing appointment and you've scheduled it too soon and you haven't given yourself enough time. So get on the MLS, learn it, learn how to do a CMA. Um, it's actually quite easy, especially in the market today with so few listings. Now, that's not to dismiss and say that there aren't rural properties or odd properties that have something about them that just makes it harder to find comps. It's really still the same steps. You're just having to expand. You just have to expand and expand. So expand the amount of time on the market, expand your location to other like areas, expand the square footage, expand everything to try to see what kind of comps you can find. 
Um, and then sometimes because based on what the seller told you they wanted for the house, you could just have to search by price to see what you can find in their area at that price point and work your way from there. It just depends on how unique the property is that makes it harder. Um, it's not, that's not the norm though. That's not the norm. All right. So you're going to go to search in, in our fake scenario, we're going to say residential. I have some things preset in here, so I'll bypass that. Um, so you'll want to check actives, contingents, pendings, ideally sold in the past zero to 180 days. If I have to expand that, then this is where I'm going to expand it. If I have too many listings, I can shrink it here too. I'm looking for single family in style. Let me say this. If it's a two-story, I'm probably not checking anything. The only thing I'm going to select in style is something very specific like ranch. Otherwise, there, I wish that there was just a simple two-story tab, but there's not. It, it's, it says a lot of different things. Um, colonial, conventional, contemporary. I don't know what it is, or does that really matter that much? Is a traditional home not comparable to a conventional home? If it's the same square footage in the same air area and you're built. So I'm probably only gonna select if it says ranch or if it's a, um, maybe a Cape Cod, maybe. Just be selective in the styles that you're gonna choose. I'm not using anything below there. I'm going to search, let me just go in the middle and say Summit County. And then I'm going to, um, I'm probably not going to use, I don't like the radius search, by the way, because wouldn't we all agree that depending on what is your location, let's just say, because we're here in Solon, if I did a 20 mile radius from this office, I'm going into Chagrin Falls, I'm going into Bedford. I mean, like you can go into a lot of different areas within Solon from a radius search. I don't want to do a radius search. Um, I want to do everything in that same school district. Now there is times where you're forced to do a radius. The more rural you are, the more land there is, there's just are times. I just prefer to not start with radius unless I have to. So let's just pick a school district someplace in the middle. Let's just say, let's go with Fairlawn. So how do you know what school district that I'll be? Client told me. Oh, okay. And I checked it on the tax record. Okay. So in this case, we'll say they told me they lived in Fairlawn. And so I'm running the address on the tax site to see what the school district is. Because maybe someone says, oh my gosh, my kids aren't in school. I don't know what school district this is. You can find it on a tax record. Okay, so I don't have kids though. Now, can it be two school districts for one area house? It's like, what do you mean? Like, can what the zip code be for like- So I'm not searching the zip code at all. So I use this school district tab right here. So like, let's just say someone says the house is in Solon then I'm choosing Solon. Solon School District. That's right. Okay, okay. Yep. Unfortunately, in Stark County, somebody lost their head and they decided that there's locations that overlap. Fortunately, Summit Cuyahoga County, other counties, that's not the case. It's pretty straightforward most times. But like in Jackson Township, where I live, I have a Canton address, I have a North Canton address, we have a Maslin address, you can have a Canal Fulton address, but also be Jackson schools. So basically it usually be one school district per house. Correct. Okay. Yep, yep. And if I have to expand, I'm looking for other like areas. The only caveat I would say is if you're doing Cleveland, I would not select school district. Correct. All right, so yes. Yeah. When you have that, you have a crossover then from one area to another, and then that might be a radius thing too. Yeah, we always just put the ads up here. Up there. Yep. And then just do the search from there. It, it does vary location to location yeah. for sure. Because yeah. like you wouldn't choose Akron City. No. Because yeah. again, too big. So you want to know within Akron, is it Fairlawn? Is it Copley? Is it Wadsworth? Is it Barberton? Is it Ellet? There's a lot of different areas that you would reduce it to that way. So getting familiar with location where you sell makes it really important for you to know. If I'm selling in Cuyahoga County or I'm selling in Cleveland, I know 
what streets even cross over to being a similar type of home versus not. I mean, you're just going to weed it out later. So it's not that important. Let's just, for the sake of it, look at the fair one. So down here at the bottom, I'm being mindful of the fact that it says 140 matches. That's too many. So I'm not going to necessarily start with the price range, but I'm going to start with the bedrooms. And let's just pretend this house is four bedroom. So I'm going to say three plus, because if the house has three bedrooms and it has an office that could be converted into a bedroom, I might want to still see that come. Um, let's say, let's just say it does have a first floor master. Let's put one there. And now it's down to 22. So that's really good. I want to compare to other first floor masters. If I want to reduce it further, I can start doing square footage. So let's say 2,700 to, let's do 3,400. So now it's only four. You see how that jumped? I, I need more than four. So I might pull out the square footage. Maybe I want to put in a, a year range. So I want Fairlawn's an older area, so I'm not going to find a lot of new properties. So maybe I want 1965 to, let's just say 2000, because there won't be a lot. So now we're down to nine. So now I'm going to hit results. And here they are. I don't like this view for this reason. So I'm going to change the display to agent thumbnail. And now I've got more information. So now it's going to show me the photo, the address. These are all solds. So what that means is there are no active and there are no pending, which is great because I'm actually more interested in the solds. So I can see now that we've got one that's 441. We've got one that's 726, 330, 244. So now it's going to take me to my conversation that I had with the seller and the type of house that it actually is. So is it more like this or is it more like this? You can see the difference right here. This is a split level. This is a much bigger looking house that's probably in a nicer area. Um, so you're just going to go through all the notes and all of the information and try to select the ones that you think are most similar. I'm also looking at square footage. I'm also looking at acreage, year built. So like these are two very different price ranges. However, they've got similar bedrooms, vastly different square footage. See how this is 28 and this is 6,000. Both those include the basement. So depending on the square footage is going to depend on the one I'm going to select. So let's just pretend like it's this one and I'm going to check that box and then I'm going to scroll and hope that I find something else that's similar to that and similar in that price point. So let's select this one. For the heck of it, we're going to select that one and then this one. So there's my comps. I'm going to go to print and then I'm going to print the... I like the agent full with additional photos. I'll show you why. Because this is what it looks like. Front photo of the house. All the information I need to know was on the market 14 days. Year built. Everything I need to know there. Room sizes. Remarks. And then it goes through every one of the inside photos. So when I go to the listing appointment, I can sit there and go through these photos with my seller. And we can say, how do we compare? So like what I would say about this house is it is outdated. That's blue carpet. May come back. I don't know. Wallpaper seems to be creeping up on us. So maybe it will. <laughs> and you can tell that they put granite counters, but they've got stainless appliances, granite counters, and oak or maple cabinets. What I would say is still outdated. Um, so that that's the one page right there. So I'm going to print all of those. Gene, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, you you clicked print and then you, oh, you changed it to residential agent full with photos before yeah. printing. So hang on, the, my Zoom screen's on top of my page, so I can't go back. Go ahead again, tell me what you said. So when you clicked on the homes that were you gonna use for your CMA. Uh-huh. And then you click, you, I think you went to click print. Yep. But then before printing, are you changing your display again? 
before printing? Nope. Then I print the agent full with additional photos. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. And so then I'm going to have to deselect some of these. Sorry, messed up because I can't see the top of my screen. All right, so then I can then go, so now I've printed all of those and now I can go to CMA. If I want to print the CMA that's on here, which prints me out a bunch of pages, I actually like this quick scene. And I know we're going a little bit over here. Um, Quick CMA is going to give me a one pager or two if there's enough comps, and it's going to generate this port. And on here, this helps me to determine if there were pendings and actives, they would show up here. Averages, the average price per square foot, the average days on market, the average high, low, and medium price is also showing up here. Now, this only works if we're using all those comps. If I have to throw one out, then I then this form's not going to help me because it's going to skew the numbers. So you take in this one and the agent pool of photo. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's it. Questions. Uh, yep. And it go under contract, but you got an open house plan for the weekend. Do you still do the open house? So the great question. That's up to the seller. So I, I, if there's an open house scheduled and I've already marketed for it and the house goes under contract on Friday and I had a Saturday open, I say, hey, Mr. Mrs. Seller, what, what would you like to do? And that open house will be uh, for secondary offers or? Correct. Buyers? Back, well, I mean, it's always for you to get buyers. You're just not saying that to the seller. So the seller might say, hey, so London, why would I host it? Why would I let you have the house open? Well, because we have an offer and probably the offer is going to be fine, but why not have an extra layer of security and get a backup offer? So I, I would still recommend with the seller's permission to go ahead and do it. You get some disappointed guests that say, what? It's sold. Don't put a, don't, you don't have to put a sold sign on the sign. Everyone's driving by then. They're not coming. I just tell them, hey, I kept the open house because we're looking for backup offers. It's pretty customary in this market to be able to do that take it from there. The buyer might have second opinion about that. The buyer might like, what do you mean you're still doing the open house? <laughs> they don't have the right to tell you that you have to cancel unless they make it part of the contract. Anybody on Zoom have any questions besides what was in the chat? Which now I can take a quick peek at. Lots of questions. Unmute. I don't, I don't, I don't. Okay. Thank you for telling me about the marketing class, Sarah. I knew I knew we put something on there. A price or within a mile radius. So if you go too far out, they're not going to take those comps into consideration. So thank you for that too. In Stark County, they go two miles. Here they go one. It it depends on your location, and that's because you guys have more houses per mile than we do. There's they bigger will go two if there's nothing within that one. They will branch. But also lot sizes too. Yeah. So like in the city of Maple Heights, for example, what they're less than a quarter acre. I used to live there. I know they're tiny little lots. So you got a lot more houses in a mile radius than you would in Stark County on half acre lots that you you got to go further because of the fact you won't get as many listings. So no, this is why know your area. And this is why I have Janice and Sarah also, because I do not know those things. So thank you. What if there's no strong, you know how like it don't be nothing the same. Do you bring them um, like the CMA or houses that's not like theirs? It'll be like, this is the closest to it. It wasn't over. Okay. I mean, I try not to do that, but if I absolutely have to, then yes. Oh. I had a sale by owner that, that the guy that didn't want to move his plants. Um, his house used to be a model home. Yeah. So like I had no idea how to do that. Yeah. I don't have to right now, but like, how do you go about that? It's no different. I mean, you just 
I mean, because it got, you know, more aware of hair because it used to be opposite or whatever. That it yeah, I mean, but it's still, you're still, I mean, it's no, it's no more wear and tear than someone who beat on their house, right? I mean, so it, it's the same. Builders are a whole new thing to new construction, brand new construction. They know what they've got in it and they aren't, they don't give a rat's ass, sorry, about your CMA. So be careful with that. They know what they've got in it. They know what they want for it. And they usually aren't going to look at a CMA when it's new construction. So be aware of that, unless they're asking you for it. All right, guys, I'm five minutes late for another Zoom. So I'm going to let you guys go. Any further questions on this, please um, go in the chat and ask. But thanks so much for joining today.